Sean? Hey, Tucker. Great show as always. And good to see you. Hang on. I've got to fix Thank my you. button. Hang on. They're yelling at me. Fix your button. All right. There we go. But I, you fix, need a button. Yeah, I'll button. give you one. Uh, <laughs> great show. All right. Welcome to Hannity. Busy news night. So with zero evidence of Trump-Russia collusion, 400 42 days of stupidity into this Mueller partisan witch hunt. Well, your mainstream corrupt media is literally in this country desperately searching for a new crisis every second of every day. This time they're trying to focus their attention on their favorite topic. Oh, themselves. They're narcissistic. And one particularly devout anti-Trump fake journalist over at fake news CNN is so openly concerned the president's rhetoric could endanger members of the media. But we're going to show you how the White House press secretary, Sarah Sanders, absolutely decimated this person. We'll tell you about it in a minute during today's very tense briefing. Plus, we're going to help remind the anti-Trump fake news CNN network why so many Americans chant at you that you suck. Americans don't trust your abusively biased coverage. And despite the constant stream of negative, negative coverage from the media, well, the president's poll numbers are going higher and higher and higher, which, by the way, comes as the administration is now combating, quote, Russia election meddling in a big way, something that Obama failed to actually do. Obama said this couldn't happen in this country. Trump needs to focus on, on getting voters and stop whining. Okay, moments ago, by the way, the president wrapped up a massive rally in Pennsylvania. We'll show you those best moments. We also have the very latest details. Day three of the Paul Manafort trial of the century, a 2005 tax case. Sit tight, buckle up. It's almost Friday. Time for tonight's breaking news opening monologue. We're glad you're with us. All right, those crisis peddlers are at it again. Your mainstream destroy Trump media has constantly tried and constantly failed to sink the Trump presidency. And night after night, they're pushing scandal after scandal. It's day after day, and now it has come full circle. Now, tonight, the outrage of the day is centered around members of the media talking about themselves and their own little bubble, and how some believe that the president's rhetoric and conservative rhetoric and people chanting at them and any criticism against them actually is putting them in danger. All right, let's be very clear, get it off the table, as I said last night. Violence against any member of the press, frankly, anybody, is reprehensible. No one that I know, no real conservative, would ever call for or support any violence against the media. But I also said last night I'd be the first person to jump in and personally defend any journalist who was attacked anywhere in the country. And by the way, I trained five days hard, MMA. Frankly, I think I'd be an asset to them. And I'm pretty confident I could be effective. But let's also be clear. The fact that the people of this country are so fed up with their bias, their lying, is not a call for violence at all. As a matter of fact, it's actually freedom of speech and our duty to call out blatant lies, fake news for what it is. And it's no surprise that you, the American people, no longer trust the so-called mainstream media. Here's just one recent example. Today, the Trump-hating New York Times, the so-called paper of record, they actually defended the hiring of a person who once tweeted, quote, hashtag, cancel white people and quote are white people genetically predisposed to burn faster in the sun thus logically being only fit to live underground like groveling goblins end quote i was equating trump to hitler before it was cool that's the new york times why would the american people trust any organization that proudly hires that person now, today, the president tweeted, quote, they asked my daughter, Ivanka, whether or not the media is the enemy of the people. She correctly said no. It is the fake news, which is a large percentage of the media that is the enemy of the people. Now, the press is absolutely a vital part of any democracy. Their rights are guaranteed in our Constitution, but so are the rights to freedom of speech and the president calling them out for the lies that they tell. And the American people also have a right. And when they know a network is feeding them lies, propaganda, misinformation, every single second of every single minute of every single day, week after week, month after month, year after year, Year, they're right to call them out. In fact, one so-called news network is so blinded by this anti-Trump derangement rage that they have, they don't even remember how destructive, how aggressive, how insane, how pathological their own rhetoric was even before day one of the Trump presidency. But we've got the videotape to remind you. Take a look. 
Smith. What he's done is create a lot of hatred and hostility between groups in this country after a half century of us trying to bring people together. Well, the talking heads missing something when they pin it all on the economy. What about racial anxiety as a factor? So the Arizona Republic getting so many death threats over an endorsement is an example of how, how overheated the rhetoric is. Another example out of North Carolina today, the firebombing of a local GOP office. Yeah. But that kind of action is unacceptable. Mm -hmm. And uh, we need to have the temperature come down on all sides right now. Unfortunately, Donald Trump is the lead in terms of raising the temperature mm -hmm. at, at this moment in time. Um, I think that if there's one thing that Donald Trump could do now that might uh, calm some people uh, we're on track for a tragedy no we're on the track for the best economic recovery we've had in 15 years so as you can see fake news cnn quick to lower the level of discourse in this country that was the same guy that said this is a a white lash but that didn't stop cnn so-called chief white house correspondent the king of lies the king of fake news jimmy acosta from trying to self-righteously seize the moral high ground at today's press briefing but by the way, he didn't win this round. Take a look. I think it would be a good thing if you were to say right here uh, at this briefing that the press, the people who are gathered in this room right now, uh, doing their jobs every day, asking questions of officials like the ones you brought forward earlier, are not the enemy of the people. I, I, I think we... We deserve that. I think the president has made his position known. I also think it's ironic. I'm, I'm so trying to answer your question. Okay. Well, I, I politely waited, and I even called on you, despite the fact that you interrupted me while calling on your colleague. Well, you I said it's ironic, question, which is why yes. I interrupted. I'm trying. But if you if you finish, yes. if you would not mind letting me have a follow up, that would be fine. But it's ironic. Jim, uh, that not only you and the media attack the president for his rhetoric uh, when they frequently lower the level of conversation in this country. Repeatedly, repeatedly, the media resorts to personal attacks without any content other than to incite anger. Boom, checkmate Sarah Sanders. She then helped remind fake news Jim Acosta about the real enablers of violence in this country during this powerful beatdown. Take a look. The media has attacked me personally on a number of occasions, including your own network, said I should be harassed as a life sentence, that I should be choked. ICE officials are not welcomed in their place of worship and personal information is shared on the Internet. When I was hosted by the Correspondents Association, of which almost all of you are members of, you brought a comedian up to attack my appearance and call me a traitor to my own gender. In fact, as I know, um, I'm, as far as I know, I'm the first press secretary in the history of the United States that's required secret Secret Service protection. No, the media the continues to ratchet course. up the Are verbal assault the against yeah. the president and everyone in this administration. And certainly we have a role to play, but the media has a role to play for the discourse in this country as well. Checkmate Sarah Sanders. As you can see, there are real acts of violence, harassment, aggression. It happens every day. There are a lot of nuts out there. I, I know personally like so many in the public eye, I've had numerous death threats over the years, white powder mailed to my office, and guess what? None of that is fun. And I'll be the first to stand up and say everybody has a right to freedom of speech. But saying that you're a liar and calling out fake news is only words. Nobody's supporting any violence. So don't make accusations that are untrue. Many in the media, they're all too happy to play down violence that are, have been, over the years, perpetrated against conservatives. For example, just today, a man arrested after leaving majority whip Steve Scalise a threatening voicemail. Remember, 2017, Steve Scalise, Republican, was shot by a deranged Bernie Sanders supporter. I don't remember the biased press assigning blame for that violence, and nor did I. You can't hold one psycho accountable and, and attribute it to some other person. Now, remember during the Obama administration, no member of the mainstream media feared for their lives or blamed Obama for random acts of violence against conservatives because he said things like this. I might have to put Mr. Burgess on Fox News. You know, I'll give him. I'll put, uh, I'll put, I'll put Mr. Burgess up against uh, Sean Hannity. He'll tear them up. I need you to go out and talk to your friends and talk to your neighbors. I want you to talk to them whether they're independent or whether they are Republican. I want you to argue with them and get in their face. Sean Hannity goes high, they go low. Tear me up? 
Oh, get in their face? Wow. As you can see, all the feigned moral outrage coming from many in the media, it's just one more fake crisis that is being concocted and pushed by the fake news media, people that are just hell-bent, waking up every day and maligning the president. Every minute, every second, every day, every week. And despite all of this, the president, well, he's polling better than ever before. Rasmussen poll out today. The president's approval rating now stands at a solid 50%, which, incidentally, is five points higher than... Obama during the same time frame. This is huge news with the midterms just around the corner. And earlier tonight, during his rally in Pennsylvania, the president, well, and the abusively biased press, he took them on and so much more. Let's take a look. We're doing better in all of these states than we did on election night. Much better. Despite only negative publicity, only negative stories from the fakers back there. Whatever happened to fair press? Whatever happened to honest reporting? I was asked to have tea with the Queen, who is incredible, by the way. So I was about 15 minutes early, and I'm waiting with my wife, and that's fine. Hey, it's the Queen, right? We can wait. We then go up and we have tea. And I didn't know this, it was supposed to last for 15 minutes, but it lasted for like an hour because we got along. We got along. So here was the story by the fake news. The president was 15 minutes late for the queen. Wrong. And then here's the rest of the story. No, here's the rest. Here's the rest of the story. So they said I was late when I was actually early, number one. Number two, I guess the meeting was scheduled for 15 minutes and it lasted for almost an hour. The president overstayed. <laughs> but they can make anything bad because they are the fake, fake, disgusting news. And the president also addressed immigration. By the way, a shout out to Rush Limbaugh and yours truly. I was shocked. Take a look. We're fighting a war and we're fighting a war on drugs. They're bringing in drugs. They're bringing in lots of bad people. We're getting the hell. We're stopping it. So we're going to be taking some very tough actions. I don't know if it's before the election or after the election. You know, a lot of the Republicans say, and they're good. They're good. We need more Republicans, but they're friends of mine. They say, President, you know, and some of them are really tough guys. And they said, sir, we're better off if we wait till after. I say, it's better before. Let's do it before. Sir, we're better off. You know who thinks it should be before? Rush Limbaugh thinks it should be before. Before the election. You know who else? Sean Hannity. A lot of them. A lot of them. Great people. Do it before. We're 96 days away. This is, and I am, this is not hyperbole. This is real. The single most important midterm election in our lifetime. Look at your screen. That is their agenda. Take a look. What do they want to do? They want to impeach this president, but don't say it. And what else? They want their crumbs back. What else? They want to get rid of ICE and open borders. And what else? Oh, they want to block the Supreme Court nominee and end the investigations into their corrupt deep, deep state. It's only been 18 months. Obama gave us 13 million more Americans on food stamps, 8 million more in poverty, lowest labor participation rate since the 70s, worst recovery since the 40s, 51-year low in home ownership rate. He accumulated more debt than every other president before him combined, and then he tried to bribe the mullahs in Iran that say death to America, death to Israel, with $150 billion in cash and other currency. He let Assad cross his phony red line in the sand, and Russia, well, was left totally un check. Oh, nobody can influence our elections. Devin Nunes warned about it in 2014. Oh, and President Trump needs to stop whining. No one could do it. No serious person believes that. And many on the left and the media today are constantly, constantly just obsessing about Russia, Russia, Russia. The Trump administration has been 10 times stronger than anything Obama did. And after eight years of ignoring the hostile regime of Russia, the bad actor Putin, this president is actually taking potential election meddling seriously. Look at the presser from earlier today. 
Since January 2017, the President has taken decisive action to defend our election systems from meddling and interference. This includes measures to heighten the security and resilience of election systems and processes, to confront Russian and other foreign malign influence in the United States. The progress we have made is real and the nation's elections are more resilient today because of the work we are all doing. But we must continue to ensure that our democracy is protected. What we see is the Russians are looking for every opportunity, regardless of party, regardless of of uh, uh, whether or not it, it applies to the election uh, to continue their pervasive efforts to undermine our fun fundamental values. Any moment is just a moment before, you know, the, the dial can be turned up one, uh, much as we saw in 2016. Again, not in terms of affecting the vote count, but in terms of potential penetration of voter registration databases or something like that. President's actually countering Russia, but your corrupt media is more focused on covering the trial of the century. Paul Manafort, because of a tax issue from 2005, a case not about Russia, not about the 2016 campaign, not about President Trump. He didn't know him then. It's not about collusion. Robert Mueller, what the hell is this? And sadly, like every federal case, chances are high they'll try and get they can indict a ham sandwich and get a ham sandwich guilty. But so far, Mueller's legal team is facing pretty stiff pushback from Judge Ellis, who's presiding over that trial. After some speculation that the prosecution wouldn't even call their star witness, and that's former Manafort business partner Rick Gates, Ellis reprimanded T. Mueller, saying they can't prove conspiracy without him. And he's also consistently pushed back on the prosecution's criminalizations of the fact that the guy is wealthy. It's not a crime to be rich or spend money. We'll monitor this trial, but remember it was Ellis that said they're putting the screws to Manafort so that he'll sing or compose so they can either, oh, prosecute or impeach Donald Trump. Now, this has zero impact on the president, not about him. Mueller tried and failed to turn the screws on Manafort, and guess what? Nothing. Anyway, joining us now uh, from the Trump Organization, he's the son of the president, Eric Trump. How are you? That was Great such to an see incredible you. monologue. Thank you. I'm sorry to so make you well sit done. through this. Let, look, let me, you dealt with this in the campaign. You deal with this every day. You see they lie about your father. They twist, they turn, but they wake up and feign all this moral outrage. Like I, I would think as a son, it's hard, but you also know they're lying. Yeah. The hypocrisy is unlike anything you can ever imagine, right? You have them attacking Barron. You have them attacking Tiffany. You have them attacking our entire family. You have them out there spewing garbage every single day on CNN and all these other networks about my father, right? Covering nonsense while forgetting about the fact that our economy grew at 4.1%, that we have the lowest unemployment in history, that jobs are coming back to the country, that the stock market's at record high. They forget all about that. Defeat right? ISIS, they got out of Iran, Jerusalem's the capital of Israel. Oh, and little rocket man's not firing so, rockets. So, 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 so they spew nonsense all day, and then little Jim Acosta gets, you know, belittled at a rally, and all of a sudden, you know, I'm holier than... I mean, it's really, Eric, it's really you, incredible. Without detail, has your family been threatened? I've been threatened. Our Don's family's been threatened, been threatened. All of us. We've all had white powder show up at our house, right? Did you, it, by the way, I had an assistant that had to one day choose quarantine this poor assistant for eight hours yeah. because of that. And by the way, there's no moral outrage about that, right? When Ben Shapiro goes to Berkeley to try and give a speech, right, and there's protests in the street, there's no moral outrage about that. You know, let the man have freedom of speech. Let him go out there and speak to people who want to listen to him. But when it happens to them, when they're offended by a message, all of a sudden... Did you, you see know. what they said about Melania, a Democratic candidate, this week? What they've said about both your sisters. And you know what? You know how much I was reported? That comment on Melania, which was one of the truly most disgusting, disgusting. things. Yeah. You know what they said about that? Nothing. You know who was the only person who actually really, you know, came to Melania's band? Hmm. Was Laura Ingram. Laura came out and she was punching and Excuse she was me. punching. Hello. And you, obviously. Okay. Hello, up. I'm here. But yeah. you know what? Yeah. No one else in the media no, did anything it's hard. about it. And it's disgusting. By the way, she is the loveliest woman. It's true. Your little brother is a great kid. Yep. I met. Why does he have to turn on a television set uh, with a decapitated, bloody, severed head of your father? Yep. And... By the way, that person was employed by CNN at the time. And, and no one ever says anything about it. And then when a couple people chant, CNN sucks, all right, CNN sucks because of this biased coverage and everything else. By the way, Eric, all of a sudden, everybody starts crying. It's, it's really incredible, Sean. CNN sucks. They yeah, really, I agree. The problem with them, and I tried to give them advice, of course, they're not going to listen, 
is I don't even think it's sort of like I was watching Peter Strzok that day. And he seems like he believes he's a super patriot, that he knew better than the American people. We're going to stop him. We're going to have an insurance policy. We need to get to the bottom of that. And of course, we will eventually. But it's sort of like the media. They never thought he could win. They mocked that he was running. He beat 16 other people. He beat the Hillary Clinton machine, even with a fix in an, in an investigation in her and won against him. And which now you didn't they know downplay it. Now they downplay it. So, you know, it's really amazing. During the campaign, my father said, you know, what my biggest goal, if I could achieve 3% GDP growth, I would absolutely love it. Right. So now he's at 4.1% GDP growth. Right. And they're not even touting that. They're not even they were mocking him. When, when, he, sa- when they, he said he could achieve three, he'll never achieve three. The New York Times came out and said, he'll never achieve 3DP, 3% GDP growth. Economy, you know, economists think he's lying about that. Then he achieves 4.1% growth, and, and they don't even compliment him on doing it. I mean, I'm actually they forget convinced about it. if he cured cancer, they, they wouldn't still give him credit. Him. No, they wouldn't give him credit. Of course not. Okay, so now the question is, you, it seems that the people are now aware sure. of what the media's agenda is. So this, to me, this midterm is about the six items that I just mentioned. Um, you are even working on 2020 already, but we got an election in 96 days. What do you say to those people that maybe only go out for presidential elections and there's a lower turnout in midterm election years? Well, listen, I think we're going to do very, very well. Um, and I think this country, by every quantifiable measure, is doing better today than it's ever done before. People are seeing that. And I think, listen, you started the opening monologue with the fact that he's above 50% in, in the polls right now, right? I his, think he his polls highest, low, too. His highest ever. Yeah, and I think, I think you're right. There's probably extra factor in there. Our economy is doing incredible. Our stock markets are off the chart. He's actually defending this country from NATO, from getting ripped off. Trade deals. Unemployment, trade deals, everything. The deal you know that he just sad? struck with, with, with the EU last week. I mean, Imagine you're in a position and things are getting better. And for when America does well, the Democrats and the left-wing media, they're mad because they're proven wrong. They should be mad. They should be mad because right now they have nothing to run on. They have no leadership. They have no message. They don't stand for anything. He's doing well by every quantifiable measure. So the only thing that they can do is, oh, he's a racist, he's a sexist, he's a this, he's a that, right? The same soundbite that they've used for the last three years that hasn't worked at all. They've used it for the 30 years. They have years nothing. What, what, what do they stand for? They stand for what? High taxes? Is that what they stand for? They stand for what the crumbs. G- getting rid of, yeah. Open borders, Obamacare. Well, open borders, getting rid of, of ICE, brave men and women who are fighting for the safety of our families, of our children every single day. Is, 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 is that what they're going for? Great They're going to lose that all day long, Sean. They're going to lose that all day long. Great to see you again. Congrats Great on the day. baby, too. I saw a Thank picture. You. Very cute. Thank uh, you. Thank you. He's good Thank little, looks good like little cute guy. mom. Uh, okay. Good. <laughs> yeah, it's easy. All right, when we come back, former Speaker of the House, Newt Gingrich, and the great one, Mark Levin, straight ahead. Republicans just passed the biggest tax cuts in the history of our country. And the Democrats want to lift them way up. Remember that when you go to vote, they want to end your tax cuts and they want to lift it up so they can waste your money on a lot of nonsense. All right, that was President Trump earlier tonight at his Pennsylvania rally. Joining us now, the author of the New York Times bestseller, Trump's America, the truth about our nation's great comeback, former Speaker of the House, Newt Gingrich. Um, You know districts as well, if not better than anybody I know. I've reminded this audience that I was the MC the night you became speaker. It was the first time that Republicans took the House in 40 years. So in off year elections, midterm elections, the power, the, the party in power at the White House usually loses on average 15 seats. Some years it's more, some years it's even a little less. There are 100 competitive races, 86 are deemed Republican defend districts. That's a lot of defending. They got to win 61 of those seats and three of the 14 Democratic seats that are in play. Well, look, I I think we have two futures this fall. You know, back in October of 2016, when you and I were among the very few people who thought Donald Trump could win, and all of these same experts, everybody right now who's talking about a blue wave, was convinced Hillary was going to win. Just go back and pull up the, cl- the, the clips and the quotes. It's embarrassing. Now, what happened? 
Well, what happened was Trump had the guts to fight it out. He had the guts to go nose to nose with Hillary. He had the guts to take on the elite media. He had the guts, no matter what the poll said, to campaign five or six or seven rallies a day. So where are the House Republicans? This is not complicated. I've done this for my whole life. Joe Gaylord and I, and you know Joe, who helped design the 94 campaign, are writing a brief paper right now to say to House Republicans, you know, suck it up. If you're prepared to go nose to nose with the left, and you're prepared to tell the truth, and you're willing to wage a national campaign, you want open borders? Or do you want to control who comes in the U.S., including MS Thernstein gangsters? You want really great economy, really great growth? Or do you want to go back to food stamps, dependency, big government, etc.? Go down the list. We have a chance here for a historic election to give the American people an honest choice between a radical uh, extremist Democratic Party in which the progressive wing is gradually being destroyed by the radical extremists, or they can try to appease the elites. And I'll tell you, if they, if they run a district-by-district district campaign, they will lose the House. It is impossible in the modern era. You're proof of it. Rush Limbaugh's proof of it. You're in 435 districts every day. And so Republicans got to decide they're going to win the fight. They're going to win the argument. They got all the issues on their side. But the question is, do they have the courage? Let me ask you this. So the president tweets out about Robert Mueller, tweets, tweets out about Jeff Sessions, about the witch hunt. Uh, he was very clear in saying that, no, it's fake news. Uh, most media is not the enemy of the people, but the fake news ones are because they don't tell the American people the truth. What does the president do? How do you how should he be dealing with this cloud that has been hovering over his head with no evidence whatsoever, like, for example, Paul Manafort. There's nothing about Russia, nothing about the president, nothing about the campaign, nothing about collusion. It was a 2005 tax case, but Hillary Clinton's never been indicted. How does he, how does he navigate what he believes and what I also agree with is unfair and a witch hunt leading into this midterm? Look, I, I think he can do three things that would be very decisive, and that would change the whole picture. The first is, let me just point out to everybody in the audience, 98 or 99 percent of what Mueller's doing is not covered by Sessions' recusal over the Russian campaign incident. 98 or 99 percent. Sessions, if he did his job, could intervene tonight or tomorrow, and would be totally within his authority, uh, and he should. Number two. The president ought to take every single example we're talking about and simply declassify it. I mean, I want to see every decision memo about Benghazi where the Obama team consciously decided to lie to the American people. I want to see all the decision memos about Hillary Clinton. The president can order them released. I mean, he has the ability by executive order to say, I want them out by next Thursday. Don't give me this baloney about it's going to take 22 years. Get them out. Third, I think we ought to look very carefully at, at what this case is all about. Mueller has hired a bunch of very left-wing Democrats. They are clearly a hunting party. And I think the president should challenge Mueller head on. Mueller, he should say to the president, he should say to Mueller, I dare you to hold a press conference and tell the American people any evidence you have that you think is relevant to why you were originally hired. Give us any evidence you have, because I don't think Mueller has any evidence, and I think it'll be embarrassing at how little he I think knows. This what case he's done is he's gone, over, he's gone over there. I think that's embarrassing. A 2005 tax case, the judge even said it, put the screws to him so he sings or composes to either prosecute or impeach Trump. Let's not kid ourselves. And the judge said that to Mueller's team. All right, Mr. Speaker, good to see you. As always, thanks for being with us. All right, when we come back, the great one, Mark Levin, he wants to weigh in on all things Mueller, Manafort, and much more. Straight ahead. We're being hindered by the Russian hoax. It's a hoax, okay? I'll tell you what, Russia's very unhappy that Trump won. That I can tell you. I was the one that let out 60 diplomats. I was the one that complained about the fact that Germany 
is paying billions of dollars for a ridiculous pipeline coming into Germany. They're paying billions and billions of dollars a year to Russia. I was the one that complained about it. All right, that was the president just a short time ago, his rally in Pennsylvania, ripping the Russia hoax. And just moments ago, President Trump, he arrived at Morristown Airport in New Jersey, as I believe he is headed for Bedminster. Joining us now with reaction on this and so much more is the host of the number one rated cable show, 10 o'clock on Sunday evenings, Life, Liberty and Levin. Thank me. God bless us. And the host of CRTV's uh the CRTV's Levin TV. Life, who Liberty, entire, and Levin. Who has an entire Levin network TV. named after them except you? Yes. Uh, how are you, my friend? I'm doing great. How are you? By the way, for five seconds, I, wa I want to join you in celebrating Rush Limbaugh's 30 years who made it possible for all of us to do what we do. The man has taken more spears and arrows, and it's such a great honor to call him my friend. And what he's done for this country is really incalculable. Anyway, go right ahead. Well, I got to tell you, and I mean this without talk radio for 30 years and him bleeding that that way and, and forging that path and without Fox, I, I honestly, let's talk about Acosta and how corrupt this news media right. is. And they're a bunch of crybabies. Oh, they're calling us fake news. Oh, they're inciting. That's not violence. That's called freedom of speech. It's like, I guess they have freedom of the press to lie like they do. I would say this, you know, a lot has been said about uh, the president calling fake news the enemy of the people. I have a different take on this. Why do the press hate the American people? Over 65 million people, give or take, voted for Donald Trump for president of the United States. I wrote this down. Various press outlets, reporters, hosts, or their guests have called millions and millions of Americans Nazis, racists, deranged, cultists, deplorables, and even worse, how do the press in this country justify calling tens of millions of people such outrageous names? And we conservatives have watched as the press have destroyed, as they're seeking to destroy Trump, Palin, Bork, Clarence Thomas, Ronald Reagan, the list goes on and on and on. The D.C. press corps today is the least professional press corps in my lifetime. They think that their job is to make it impossible for the president to function, to sabotage him and to advance the cause of the ide ideologues, to advance the cause of a rogue prosecutor by the name of Mueller. And so the press really needs to, to be circumspect, take a look at itself. It won't. As long as they keep putting clowns like Jim Acosta out there, who is a drama queen of sorts, and uh, who like to report on themselves and talk about themselves, as long as it's impossible to tell a late night comedian uh, from Jake Tapper and Jake Tapper from the porn star and all the rest of it. This is going to be the reaction of the American people. Well, if it wasn't so important, this is where, you know, thank God the American people have choices. I, and to, we're a part of it is an honor. And I feel blessed to be able to do this, as I know you do. Let me ask you this and let you put on your attorney's hat for a minute. For those that don't know, you were the chief of staff or I think one of the greatest attorney generals ever. And that was Ed Meese. Um, why would they ever allow an illegitimate investigation run by Mueller and his merry band of Democratic donors to interview President Trump when there's no evidence, collusion's not a crime, no evidence whatsoever. It's been a witch hunt from day one. Look at what they're doing with Manafort. I think Attorney General Meese at this point would have stepped in. I honestly do. And uh, Newt Gingrich was on to something there. Much of the power being exercised by the Deputy Attorney General in lieu of the Attorney General has nothing to do with, uh, with Jeff Sessions' recusal. Jeff Sessions will not be attacked by the media as long as he's quiet. Quiet. The minute he speaks up or does something, he will be attacked. Look, the matter for trial, here's what I don't get. Most of the issues they're raising, if he did all these things, bank fraud, embezzlement, uh, tax fraud, and all the rest, and he did it during the Obama administration, who was the FBI director? Mueller. Mueller was the FBI director. He did nothing about it, apparently, when he was the FBI director. Apparently they didn't know anything. So now Manafort is the campaign chairman for Donald Trump and they throw 17 left-wing Democrat prosecutors at the guy who work for the special counsel. That is a matter for the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Eastern District of Virginia. That's number one. Now uh, Mueller's pushing the other cases to the Southern District of New York. Then they set up Lieutenant General Mike Flynn. Then they have a few uh, 
uh, uh, lesser lights here where they get for false statements or something like that. What the hell do we have this special counsel for? You don't want to know why? Because he wants Trump, and he wants to interview Trump, and he wants to get him on obstruction of justice. And now he's threatening, I hear, Perjury trap. that uh, you got, what he's going to do, you see, is issue a subpoena to pull the president in front of a grand jury. Let me tell you something, Mr. Mueller. You're not the king of the universe. And I hope the president's lawyers are listening to me and the president right now. Here's what you should tell Mr. Mueller. Have a meeting with him and tell him you're unconstitutional under the appointments clause. What you're doing is unconstitutional as far as we are concerned. We are not going to bow to you. This is the office of the president of the United States. You are a rogue prosecutor. Now get the hell out of my office and make sure the door doesn't hit you in the ass. I'll see you in court. That's the beginning and the end of it as far as I'm concerned. Let me ask you, I'm watching this thing on Manafort. I don't know what Paul Manafort did in 2005. I don't think Donald Trump who Paul, knew who Paul Manafort was in 2005. We know Judge Ellis was well, apparently right. Apparently Mueller didn't. He was the FBI director at uh, the time. I, I don't think the president knew him. I don't think anybody knew. But they pulled this out of mothballs just to put the screws to him so they could get him to sing or compose, as Judge Ellis said, so that they could prosecute or impeach Trump. In this whole tax case from 05, there'll be no talk of Russia. There's going to be no talk about the campaign. There'll be no talk about his work for Donald Trump. There'll be no talk of collusion. This is just a, this is just a cheap attempt to literally go after a guy they never would have gone after because they're trying at all costs to get the president. And so the question is, Rod Rosenstein, who gives a rubber stamp to all this and created this in the first place, by appointing his dear friend, the man he first worked for at the Justice Department, Mr. Mueller, who was uh, best friends with Mr. Comey. What a colossal disaster. Uh, you have Jeff Sessions, a man I've known for 30 years, who's sitting this out. He shouldn't be sitting it out. These are constitutional issues. And quite frankly, Mr. Mueller can't keep hiding behind his 17 left-wing Democrat donor prosecutors. Where the hell is Congress? I want to know what Mr. Mueller thinks he can do under our Constitution. I want to know what Mr. Mueller well, thinks he I can do to... under the two Department of Justice memos as well. Mark, you know when I say tick-tock, something big is coming that will blow this all out of the water. Thank you for being with us. The great one, Mark Levin. When we come back, Pastor Daryl Scott, he will join us saying that the president is probably the most pro-African-American president he has seen in his lifetime. He'll be here with Daryl Parks, and we've got the numbers next. You've heard this, but I'm going to say it over and over because I'm really proud of it. Remember I said, what do you have to lose? What do you have to lose? African-American, so many others, I said, what do you have to lose? You have high crime rates, you have horrible education, you have this. I went through a list of 10, that's what happened. African-American, Hispanic, Asian. You have the lowest level of unemployment in the history of our country. What, how does somebody fight that, right? How does somebody fight it? The president earlier tonight talking about how unemployment numbers for minorities, African Americans, Hispanic Americans, Asian Americans are vets in 14 states, all record lows. Now, and yesterday, a friend of the show, our friend Pastor Daryl Scott, who also serves as the CEO of the National Diversity Coalition for a Trump CEO, had this to say about the president during a White House meeting with inner city pastors. Take a look. To be honest, this is probably going to be the, and I'm saying this at this table, the most pro-black president that we've had in our lifetime because, and I try to, you know, analyze the people that I encounter. This president actually wants to prove something to our community, our faith-based community and our ethnic community. The last president didn't feel like he had to. He felt like he didn't have to prove, he got a pass. This president, is, is this administration is probably going to be more proactive regarding urban revitalization and prison reform than any president in your lifetime. And Pastor Daryl Scott joins us now along with attorney Daryl Parks. All right, Daryl, the numbers are in. Hi. Simple question. Is the African-American community, Hispanic community, women in the workforce, Asian-Americans, vets, are they doing better under President Trump? Or did they do better under eight years of Obama? We don't well, know which Daryl you're talking to. Without <laughs> <Darryl Parks. laughs> 
Yes. <laughs> All right. I'm well, sorry. Well, <laughs> well, Sean, what do we want to see the, the, see nah, the nah, president nah, nah, really nah, address nah, nah, the issue? I asked you a specific question. No, no diversion. No, well, I'm talking well, to the education who, issue, though. Is the, is the African-American community and all these minority communities, are they doing better under Trump or Obama? Sean, historically black colleges are not doing better. Students uh, who need okay. need-based financial aid are not doing better. How about, an, how about better. unemployment That's what the and the economy, Trump or Obama? But here's what here's the challenge. What Forget actually did the President see, Trump you know, do to help got, unemployment? You know, Pastor, I, when you don't want to answer a question, that kind of means I put him in a corner called checkmate. I play chess. He can't answer this question because he knows the answer is Trump. It's not Obama, Pastor Scott. Listen, unemployment is at an all-time low. I've lived through 12 different presidents. And, and, and contemplating that fact, this president is the only one that I'm aware of, and, and I, I'm aware of the, the, the prison initiatives, the urban revitalization initiatives. He's focusing and concentrating on uh, making a concerted effort to improve the quality of living for black America. So it's easy for me to say what I said on yesterday because, you know, I lived through a lot of different presidents and I haven't seen any other take a pro proactive stance towards black America like this president is doing. Daryl Scott, uh, I'm sorry, Daryl Parks. <laughs> Well, let me say this. I think on the pro-black issue, for example, this president is not appointing black judges, Sean. And so that point alone, show me the numbers as to where he's appointing black judges to the federal bench. We had disproportionately in the Obama years, when you look at the millions more in poverty food stamps, out of the labor force, not buying homes, the black and Hispanic community were disproportionately impacted. Now the opposite has happened, and you can't even say, good job, President Trump. It's good for everybody. Good job, President it's Trump, good. but we have other issues. So you we wish you voted for issues. President for example, Trump sure. now? But no, we, but I want to see President Trump put more Pastor. blacks in his administration. We don't see black faces in his administration. Pastor. But listen, listen, pa uh, Brother Parks, listen. When people ask me why aren't there more blacks in the administration, I ask them where were those blacks during the campaign? Us blacks that were with him during the campaign were vilified, ostracized, called Uncle Tom's, coon sellouts, and everything else. Now, all of a sudden, you got black people that were told to stay away from Trump during the campaign. Now you're saying, well, where's all the black people he's supposed to hire? Where were they at then? But, but Pastor Scott, he, he can still appoint black people to his, his cabinet. There's no reason that blacks should not be appropriately represented in U.S. government. It's only right. All right, we're going to watch you. He has Ben Carson in the cabinet, and I'm working with him. So what do you want? By the way, Daryl Parks, do you realize, more than one. Do you realize <laughs> Pastor more Scott than one. let me preach from it's the pulpit country. at his church? It was the worst moment. of I did terrible. All right, thank you both. When we come back, more of the president's speech from his rally in Pennsylvania. All right, during tonight's uh, rally, President Trump talked about the new face of the Democratic Party. Let's find out who it is. You know who the new star, you know who the new leader is? Maxine Waters. Very low IQ. Low IQ. No, no, Maxine Waters is like, she's like their new star. She's not saying impeach 45. I think they had a meeting and said, anyone that's saying that, don't say that, but we'll do it anyway. Let's just not be honest with the American people. And they want their crumbs back and open borders and Obamacare. All right, that's all the time we have left. Always fair and balanced, but not to destroy Trump media. Let not your heart be troubled. Ingraham, standing by. Mm -hmm. Hi. Oh, hey, hey. I'm, I'm just writing uh, Eric Trump a thank you note for mentioning me during your show tonight. So I was just getting that off. <laughs> you know, I'm sitting here and he goes, the Lord, he says, you know who's great defending Melania? Laura Ingram. I'm like, what am I, chop liver? Well, first what, of all, it's what, what is that it's all your, about? It, listen, this is why you and I have been friends for 18 years. You are number one in cable. You're like number two, number almost, you know, close oh to God. Russian radio. A little mention of someone else. You're like, oh, what about me? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Typical man. You, you know Typical why? Man. Let's, let's be honest. Everybody in this business, and you know this is true. <laughs> is overpaid, lazy, and narcissistic. And most yeah. of them are all agenda. We're honest. We're talk shows. We do journalism. We do straight interviews. We do investigative reporting. We do commentary. We do opinion. We do it all. Part of we the do radio. We do this. I mean, oh, God. Uh, by the way, how great was it, Rush 30 years, paving the way for all of us? 
I, I would not. Uh, 18 years ago, I got into radio. You and I started the same year in national radio. You were doing other stuff, but mm -hmm. 2001. All right. I, never I was the it. guy in Santa Barbara, 1987, and then mm -hmm. Huntsville, Alabama, and then Atlanta. You started the top. I'm so sorry. It was so oh, hard no, for I you. I was a lawyer, okay? Well, you, have, you have a little pity for me as a lawyer. I was a lawyer. Why don't we go on another 40 minute minutes? We'll just fill the show with us bantering back and forth at, and bickering like that. children. One Friday, one Friday when you're not uh, taking a vacation day. We're going to do that Seriously, together. You, take, you and Tucker take more vacation than anybody. Well, because you live in a palace. You don't have to go anywhere. The rest of us. Us living ramblers, okay? I can't right. win this debate. I can't no, you win. Can't. No, you, you can't. Right, you had a great show, show tonight. All right, talk to you later. Right, see you later. Welcome to Washington. We are going to do that.